good afternoon. Um, I have to say that I, I asked her to have people move forward uh, simply because I absolutely positively hate giving speeches. Hate it. When I was in your place, I hated listening to them. So I would absolutely hate to say give you one. What I would prefer for us to do is us to have a conversation, for us to have, for it to be more of a back and forth than just for me to stand here talking to you. I actually have a speech written just in case. Just so you know, if you really want to hear it, I'll give it. But I'd rather for us to actually talk uh, about Washington, D.C., about politics, about, frankly, anything you want to talk about. But if you want to hear me give a speech, I can do it. I need to practice anyway. So, well, um, first of all, can everyone hear me? Yep. Am I good? Everybody in the back? Am I good? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, once again, my name is Jesse J. Hall. I am an author and a Supreme Court writer for the Associated Press in Washington, D.C. Um, what we're going to do here today is, is that just so we don't have to sit here and listen to me in the lecture for the next hour or so. I'm going to just give a little bit of talk about what I do at the Supreme Court and the things I write about. And then I'm just going to sit back and open the floor for questions. And that way, I promise you, it'll be more interesting for everyone. Um, my parents were two public school teachers in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and Memphis, Tennessee, which they, they, uh, they're right here at the Tennessee Mississippi board. Uh, so every evening, I got to hear about what teaching what type of teaching methods work and which ones don't. And I guarantee you that they said over and over, me standing in front of a class talking doesn't work. You won't remember anything I say past 2 o'clock if I do that. So I promise you, I don't want to do that. But once again, just to be sure you know, I can. Before becoming a print journalist, I was a radio DJ and talk show host of WUMS FM in Oxford, Mississippi. I had the midnight to 4 a.m. shift, which means I already know for a fact that I can talk for the next hour straight with only three commercial breaks. <laughs> I don't want that. You don't want that. So I'll talk for a little bit, and I'll open the floor for questions. OK? All right. Um, once again, I'm the Supreme Court writer for the Associated Press. Um, I've been, I will, will have been with the Associated Press for 20 years next, uh, next April. I started as an intern in the Columbia, South Carolina Bureau back in 1994. Uh, and I uh, joined on with AP four weeks after my internship started. It's one of those things where you're in the right place at the right time. I uh, started with, I, when I started my internship, my, the Bureau of Columbia, South Carolina had eight full-time reporters. Four weeks later, four of them quit. And they said to me, hey, uh, would you mind staying on? And 20 years later, I'm still staying on. Um, but having my 20 year anniversary with AP sneaking up on me has uh, helped me realize my mortality. And that's a polite way of saying, I went to my doctor and she said, you've got to start taking better care of yourself. So, in the last few months, I've had to uh, increase my exercise regimen. And one of the things that I've taken up just in the last couple of months is boxing. Now, boxing is something that I would have told you that I would never do in my entire life. The, before two months ago, the, the last time I had on a set of boxing gloves, I believe I was five in a city park in Memphis, Tennessee, as they were trying, uh, this was one of those government programs where they are trying to get kids to exercise. So for some reason, they decided the best way to do it with a bunch of kids in a city park was to put boxing gloves on us. You can imagine how well that worked. So <laughs> since then, I haven't really done anything with boxing until about two months ago. Um, and frankly, the only reason why I did it then it was, a class, it was a class that was available at my gym at 8.45 at night. It was either boxing or yoga. Pretty easy choice if you ask me. So I started taking boxing classes. And before taking these classes, I would have told you boxing was about strength. That the person who was the 
had the strongest punches, and the person who could absorb the most punches was going to win most boxing, boxing matches. But as I take these classes, I'm finding out that this is not true. Boxing is about information. It's about finding out what your opponent can and cannot do. It's about finding out what you can or cannot do. The more information you have before you step in the ring, the greater your chances of success. Um, is your opponent a righty or a lefty? If you, if you take one step towards your opponent, will he step back or will he step into you? If you back up toward the ropes, will your opponent come towards you and go for a kill shot? Or will they back up and wait for you to come back out? All of this is information you need if you're going to be successful. Muhammad Ali was not only the prettiest. <laughs> he was not only the fastest. He was also one of the smartest boxers that you found. He watched tape after tape after tape of his opponents to figure out their strengths and weaknesses, and then formulated a plan to use these strengths and weaknesses against them. For example, one of the one of the um, most famous boxing matches was the Rumble in the Jungle, Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. Going into that fight. Muhammad Ali knew George Moore was stronger. He knew if that if he, if he stood there and got into a blow by blow fight with George Foreman, he would lose. So what did he do? He came up with a plan. He knew that George Foreman was prone to tiring out. So his plan became what we know now as a rubber duck. He backed up against the ropes and he let George Foreman tire himself out by uh, hitting him with blow after blow after blow. And he didn't choose his body ring just that hazard. Muhammad Ali knew that if he was backed up against the rope, every time George Foreman hit him, the force of the blow would not be entirely just on Muhammad Ali's body, it would be on the rope. So every time Foreman would hit him, the force of the blow would be transferred to the, to the ring rope. And Muhammad Ali would let Foreman do this until George Foreman became tired. That's when Muhammad Ali left the rope and counterattacked. And that's how Muhammad Ali won that fight, that fight. Now, what does any of this have to do with journalism? Just like boxing is about information, journalism is about nothing but information. What I do for a living is I go out and I find information. I digest that information, I translate that information, and then I provide that information to you. That is all the journalism is, the collection of information and the transference of that's what I do for a living. My job at the Supreme Court is to go there, find out what the most interesting thing is happening at the Supreme Court, write it to where everyone can understand it, and then bring it to you. Journalism is about more than just the transference of the information, because this day with technology, you can sit and watch just about any governmental function you want to on C-SPAN, on the committee websites. The Supreme Court hasn't quite gotten there yet. There's no audio and video allowed inside the Supreme Court, so everything they do has to be, but you can still see what they, see their arguments through transcripts. But nobody ever bothers to see any of this, or to watch any of this, or to read any of this. This is because the Supreme Court and most government governmental functions are done in legal ease. So just having access to the information, just having access to the Supreme Court, just having access to the Congress and the White House isn't enough. 
you need someone to be able to translate that information to what you can understand. And that's what we do in journalism. And not just in journalism, and, and also in nonfiction book writing, which I'll also get to in a minute. I need to find out, I need to be able to present to you on a daily basis at the Supreme Court, not only information that I think is important, but information that you may not think is important, but I need to find a way to make you think it is. This is, this is how, this is why you, you see, actually, frankly, just cut through it. This is why, if it bleeds, it leads. Because to get you to listen and watch the things that we think you need to, to know, we have to get you to watch and listen in the first place. And a lot of times, most, unless it deals with sex, controversy, or death, most Americans really don't care. So that is why, as journalists, we provide you with sex, death, and controversy. Because we've got to get your attention before we tell you the things we think you need to know. That's why most of the cases we deal with at the Supreme Court, most people have never even heard about. Because while they're important, they don't deal with sex, death, or controversy. But when you deal with cases including uh, cases about Obamacare, cases about abortion, cases about affirmative action, cases about the death penalty, that's when people pay attention. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on there that is important for you to know. And so I have to find a way to make you pay attention to it. And honestly, the way I normally do that is either through sarcasm or humor. That's how I, I find that I can get people's attention. And by the way, I'm normally asked this question, so I'll, I'll get it out of the way up front. I am a Supreme Court writer. However, I do not have a law degree. Never been to law school, never will go to law school. I finished my Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction at Gatsby College last year, and as I walked across the stage, I said to myself and my bank account, I am never going back to school again. <laughs> so, never went to law school, never going to law school. So, what makes me qualified to be able to translate what the Supreme Court does for you? Well, let's look at it this way. There are very few journalists out there who have ever done the thing they report on. There are very few sports journalists who ever played football, or played basketball, or played baseball. There are very few business reporters who have ever run a company. There are very few um, political reporters who ever actually held office. So, so what makes us qualified to be able to translate these things? Well, what makes us qualified is, that, is the one skill that we actually do have. We are willing to ask questions, and we are willing to talk. Once again, I know I have never gone to law school, but I have a, a, a Rolodex with about 250 lawyers who did, whom I can pick up a phone and call them and say, hey, the Supreme Court said this. What does it mean? Now, why couldn't you just call that same lawyer and say, okay, what just happened? Well, the other trick that we as journalists are able to do is that we are able to translate. That lawyer will sit there and talk to you about writs of certiorari, the, the writs of mandamus, previous precedent. But what I do as a journalist is I take all of that and I, I basically say to him, talk to me like I'm five. Explain it to me like I'm a child. And then I can then take that information, translate it, and write it at a significantly higher level, but in English instead of in German. That's what, that's what we as journalists do. That's, that's our job. Our job is to find that information, find a person who understands that information, and then be able to translate it. Um, for example, think about it when you go to a doctor. The doctor will sit there and will explain every, give you the name of every bone in your body. 
your, and be able to explain to you ex your entire digestive system. And then at the end say, you have heartburn. And you think to yourself, why didn't you say that, at, why didn't you say that first? That's what journalists do. We get those type of people to say it first. We, I find that there are very few experts in any topic that is able to actually explain that to someone who is not an expert in that topic. The, one of the favorite tricks that we use in journalism is that we say, explain to me as if I'm your 97-year-old grandma. And that's basically how we write. We write in English instead of legal jargon, instead of political jargon, instead of sports jargon. We write in English. That's what we try to do. Uh, so the rest of us can actually understand what's going on. One of the areas that I've paid more attention to at the Supreme Court has been the Miranda one. Now, all of us from TV know the Miranda law. You have the right to remain silent, you have the right to the attorney, blah, 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 so forth and so on. I, I, I have to tell you, I am a huge fan of TV cop shows. Law and order. I mean, the best day of the year is when they're doing the law and order marathons. I sit there in front of the TV, shoot my kids away, and just sit there for a couple hours. But, a lot of people don't know that the Supreme Court has made changes to the Miranda, or to the Miranda warnings over the last few years. And that's one of the areas I've been focusing on, just getting people to realize what's been done to Miranda. And by the way, do you know why there are more cop TV, cop on TV there are more cop, lawyer, and doctor shows than anything else? Because those are the three areas that the average American when they meet any one of those three people, that's usually the most stressful meetings of your life. That's the highest state that the average American will go through at any time. When you're meeting up with a, with a police officer, when you're meeting up with your doctor, when you're meeting up with your lawyer. So we empathize with the people on television dealing with the cops, doctors, and lawyers. That's why they show, they keep showing us, every show is a, is a new twist on the, doc, the doctor show. Every show is a new twist on the cop show. New twist of the lawyer show. That's why we that's why we see those those shows. Well. Another one of my interests is screenwriting. There's so many TV stations now that we that, that's, that's a growth area for writers. Now. So, but getting back to Miranda, one of we all know the, the most common form. We have the right to remain silent. Anything you can and will if you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. Do you understand these rights that they've been read? Now, as I said, the Supreme Court's been changing this. So if, if the police officer wanted you to know exactly what, was, what has been going on, they would read you this. You have the right to remain silent, but only if you tell the police you're remaining silent. You have a right to a lawyer before, during, and after questioning, even though we, the police, don't have to tell you exactly when the lawyer can be present. If you can't afford a lawyer, one will be provided to you, but we won't promise that he'll be any good. <laughs> Do you understand these rights as they've been read to you, which, by the way, are only good for the next two weeks? With that one admittedly snarky sentence, I've just reviewed for you three major Supreme Court decisions that have changed the meaning of Miranda. One that says su suspects cannot be quiet until you tell the police specifically that you're being quiet. Another that says you must tell the police, another that says that the police when they give you more your Miranda warnings, don't specifically have to tell you when your lawyer can be present. And a final one that said that a suspect's request for a lawyer is only good for 14 days 
And at that point, you have to ask for a lawyer again. Now, instead of telling you that information, that one smart consensus, I could have gone through the three Supreme Court cases that, we, that, that I've covered that made those major ch changes. But if I had done that, I guarantee you no one would have remembered the basic facts of what I've just told you. I, I'm betting that you're, likely, you're more likely to remember those Miranda changes through that one snarky sentence than you would be going through those three complete Supreme Court decisions. That's the power of properly presented information. That's the power of journalism. That same principle goes for writing nonfiction books. In addition to working at the Supreme Court, I've written my first book, which you can see right here. Um, I'm an author that likes to focus on what's called hidden African American history. Now, is it really hidden? No, not really. It's information, however, that's only known to academics. If it's not known by the majority of the people, it's hidden to me. So I take that information and I write it in a way that it becomes interesting to other people. This is a trick that a lot of nonfiction writers use. We, we take common information and we rewrite it in a way that it becomes, uh, becomes not quite so common. For example, if I told you that I was writing a book about financial trends, economic research, and market developments, you probably wouldn't read a book with that title. But I can guarantee you most of you have heard about Freakonomics. That's what Freakonomics is about. But they took that financial information and they wrote it in such a way that it became a New York Times bestseller and they made a movie about a book about economic research. I'm, I'm, I'm a little depressed because my book hasn't been made into a movie yet. Just, just, just taking a second. So, so the first book I wrote was called Black Men Built the Capital. Now, what this book was about was about African American history inside the District of Columbia. Now, well, as I said earlier, I'm originally from Holly Springs, Mississippi. Let me get off the mic. Can you hear me? All right, all right, there we go. I'm originally from a little town called Holly Springs, Mississippi. And I moved to Washington in 2000 uh, from upstate New York. So when I got to Washington, D.C., I started looking around, started looking around the city. A few months after I got to Washington, D.C., my mom comes up to visit me because, of course, you know your mom wants to make sure you're okay up when you're up there in Yankee. Any, from, by the way, this is totally Yankee territory for anybody from Mississippi. Um, so she wanted to make sure I was okay. So she comes up to Washington, D.C., and as everyone does when you come with, they have visitors in Washington, I put her in my car and we started driving around the city. And I showed her very proudly the Washington Monument, the Capitol, the White House. And after about three hours of this, my mom says, thank you. But where's the history for us? Like, what do you mean? I mean, Washington Monument, right here. Like, no. What about African Americans? There's got to be something in Washington, D.C. that represents African Americans. I mean, Washington, D.C., Chocolate City. I mean, more African Americans, more African Americans in the District of Columbia per capita than anywhere else in the United States. There's got to be something here that represents us. And I said, hmm, let's find out. And so I spent the next few years finding out. And that's what this book was about. This book was about finding out what in the District of Columbia represented African Americans. And you would think it'd be an easy thing to find out. You'd think that this is something that you can see any, you can go anywhere and see any, see, see at any time. But it actually took a little work to find out. So I'm just going to go over for you a little bit of, of some of the things that I found out while I was in, in Washington. Let's see if I can get this sorted right. Ah, 
Okay, here we go. Once again, Washington, D.C. More African Americans per capita at one point than anywhere else in America. So here's a good question to ask. Well, if there are more African Americans in Washington, D.C. than anywhere else per capita, there's got to be statues of African Americans in Washington <laughs> on public land. Where are they? Well, I actually had to sit and think about this for a while because I couldn't tell you where any of them were. So I decided to go out and find them. Here's one. Korean War Memorial. There are, there are a couple of dozen soldiers at the Korean War Memorial. Three of them represent African Americans. Vietnam Conflict Memorial, Vietnam War Memorial. This is one of the more recognizable ones. Um, they, 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 they've also been in the news recently in Washington because of the storming of the World War II Memorial by the veterans during the government shutdown. Uh, these, both the Korean and the Vietnam War Memorial, by the way, were also shut down. They also had the same barricades, but for some reason we were more interested in the World War II veterans than we were anybody else during this time period. I will not offer an opinion as to why. This is one of the, uh, the, the less well-known ones in Washington, D.C. This is the African American Civil War Monument. It sits outside of the uh, sits outside of a African American museum in Washington D.C. On the front, it has the African American soldiers. I don't have a picture of it, but on the back, the African American sailors who served in the <laughs> Civil War. And just as an aside, I just had this conversation on Facebook with one of my friends in Mississippi. Uh, he found an article that said that President Obama went to Egypt and gave a speech in Egypt saying that Islam has always been a part of American history. And this just set him off for some reason. Islam has never been part of American history. There was no Islamic founding fathers. Islam has nothing to do with this country being founded. And normally on Facebook, I stay out of these conversations. <laughs> because as a journalist, you're supposed to be neutral, blah, 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 blah. So normally I stay out of these conversations, but that was one that I just couldn't let slide by. Because frankly, this is sort of my error. More than 2,000 of General George Washington's troops during the American Revolution were Islam. There were more. They fought as freedmen for America. Now, admittedly, just like, like I said, they've admitted, none of the founding fathers of the people who actually wrote the government were Islam, that we know of. But to say that Islam had nothing to do with the founding of this country is like saying African Americans had nothing to do with the founding of this country. Once again, we might not have written the, the laws, but without those soldiers, it wouldn't have mattered. So, African American War, Memorial at Civil War Memorial. Now, this, I didn't count for a long time. This is actually, this is a bust of Martin Luther King Jr. that sits in the rotunda of the US Capitol. But I didn't count it for a long time because it's a bust, it's not a statue. So I didn't really, I sort of let this one slide. We all know this one. This is the most recent, the Martin Luther King Jr. National Memorial that uh, sits over on the tidal basin near the cherry blossoms. And there's one more going up. They're actually having a fight over it now. There's an African American, American, African American Revolutionary War Memorial planned for the National Mall, but they're running into a funding problem. They already have the plot of land, which coincidentally is directly across the street from this memorial. 
but they're running into funding problems. So the, the target date, I believe, last time I checked was 2018, 2019, something like that. So now this is a little bit of an outdated question. Where is the only statue of a real African American man on public land in Washington D.C.? There are actually two now. You just saw one. Martin Luther King Jr. is one. There is actually a second one in Washington D.C. And a bonus question: Where is the only statue of a real African American woman on public land in Washington D.C.? The answer: Lincoln Park on Capitol Hill. I used to live three blocks from this park. Lincoln Park has both. In the middle of Lincoln Park is a statue called Freedom's Memorial. It's a statue of President Lincoln with a freed slave at his foot. That freed slave is a real representation of a real person. That man was named Archer Alexander. This is the statue that I'm talking about right here. That person right there, Archer Alexander. Archer Alexander was one of the last slaves freed under the Fugitive Slave Act. Before the Fugitive Slave Act, Archer Alexander won his freedom. After that, he was one of the last ones to do so. And so, the man who designed this statue happened to be a neighbor of Archer Alexander in St. Louis, Missouri. And so as he was getting ready to build, to, to, to cast this statue, he knew of Archer's story, and he asked him, could he use his likeness? Alexander said yes. Another piece of information about this statue, this was the very first statue put up to Abraham Lincoln after his assassination. And it is one of the only statues in Washington, D.C., completely funded by the American public. No government funds went into this statue at all. It was all done by donation. And it's also one of the few, government, few statues of Abraham Lincoln that was dedicated by Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass spoke at the dedication of this statue. Now, I said there were two statues you need to know about in, in, in uh, Lincoln Park. This is number two, Mary McLeod Bethune. It, it right now is the only statue to an African-American woman in Washington, D.C. Now, there's an interesting little story that goes with this statue. Mary McLeod Bethune sits, the statue of Mary McLeod Bethune sits in the east corner of Lincoln Park. Abraham Lincoln and Archer Alexander sit in the center of, of Lincoln Park, facing west toward the Capitol Dome. Mary McLeod Bethune faces west toward the Capitol Dome. So when they put in the Mary McLeod Bethune statue, someone noticed, oh, by the way, you have her looking at Lincoln's back. And they said, there is no way Abraham Lincoln would turn his back on a woman like Mary McLeod Bethune. So what happened? They picked up Abraham Lincoln and they turned him to now where Abraham Lincoln and Mary McLeod Bethune face each other. And Abraham Lincoln has his back to the Capitol Dome. Just a little bit of trivia there. So that's just a little taste of what I do as far as African American history and, and nonfiction. Like my, the current book I'm working on right now is called Invisible African Americans and Slavery Inside the White House. And it's the story of African American slaves who actually lived inside the executive mansions with the presidents. Um, everyone, almost all of the presidents, starting from George Washington and going through Abraham Lincoln with the notable exception of the Adams, who were Quakers, who didn't believe in slavery, almost all of them brought their personal slaves to the executive mansion to live with them. George Washington, of course, did not bring his to the White House because George Washington never actually lived in the White House. At that point, the White House was in New York. 
So George Washington brought his to New York. Second one was John Adams. So Adams didn't bring any of his, didn't bring any slaves to the White House because he didn't believe in slavery. But the third one was Thomas Jefferson, who brought his slaves from Monticello to Washington, D.C., which is why one of the, the interesting facts that I found out is that the first child to ever be born inside the White House was actually the child of an African-American slave, Thomas Jefferson. The second child to be born inside the White House was a family member of Thomas Jefferson. Two different categories. Um, but this, this is actually what this is actually a book that I'm hoping will be out in a few years. I'm trying, I'm trying to find a way to make it more sexy. Just to, just to put it so I'm trying to find a way to make it more sexy. But no one loves reading textbooks. We read them because we have to. I'm trying to find a way to make this information interesting so people will want to read. Um, I sort of got I sort of got preempted by the butler because the second half of this book was going to be about the African-American servants who worked inside the White House. But now, my, one of my agent friends has told me that that ship is safe. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm pulling back and working specifically on the slaves who live inside the White House. So, um, I've now managed to talk for, I think, uh, 35 minutes. I am going to step back and say, are there any questions about anything I've said? Are there any questions about anything I haven't said? I promise you, if I can, I will answer. I will tell you up front, there are probably some questions I can't answer. There are some questions I won't answer, especially since we're videotaped. But if you come to me afterward, I might whisper an answer in your ear. But let me just let me just take a break here and say, is, are there any questions from anybody? Yes, a question, thank you. Is there any validity to the story that there were other presidents before George Washington? And I will answer that question yes and no. The answer yes is that there were presidents under the Articles of Confederation which predated the Constitution. There was an office of president before the article, under the Articles of, of Confederation. So, were there people who held the title president before George Washington? Yes. But George Washington was the first president of the United States, which didn't exist until the Constitution was ratified. I uh, actually run into that question uh, uh, several times because there, there are some, you can, I, once again, you can go to the internet and find some, so there are some people who say that, that Barack Obama wasn't the first African American president. There were other presidents who had African American blood, but uh, some of those people were the presidents who were under the Articles of Confederation. So the answer to the question is yes and no. So, yes. Could you talk a little bit about when the people protesting outside of the Supreme Court become the story or overshadow maybe something that you're trying to cover that's happening in the chamber? Ah, protesters. <laughs> the bane of our existence in Washington, D.C. And not because of their protesting, it's because they screw up traffic. <laughs> and those of us who have to get to daycare before 6 p.m., they make our lives very difficult. Uh, honestly, unless, and, and don't take this as advice, unless there, there's violence, we normally ignore them. Because while you can hear them inside the Supreme Court building, they don't have any effect on what's actually happening inside the So, um, if there's a huge case, for example, uh, let's just, and by the way, it's not the official title, and AP doesn't officially recognize it as such, but I say it, everyone will know what I'm talking about. For example, Obamacare. There were, the, the street between the Supreme Court and the Capitol was half the people. I think that made one line in a 1,500 word story. 
So if they, we gave it maybe 15 words out of 1,500. Um, unless it's unusual. Protests happen in Washington so much on everything. It wouldn't surprise me that somebody's protesting something in D.C. right now that has become commonplace. So unless something unusual happens, for example, people in wheelchairs attempting to push over barricades to go see a memorial, that's unusual. That's something that we would pay attention to. Someone holding a sign, walking up and down the street, shouting about something, is part of the D.C. ambiance now. So we really, we, we really don't pay much attention to it anymore. Yes? Do you think that's sort of cheap in the, uh, the free speech aspect of government? Do I think what cheap is? The, the fact that my petition is sort of ignored. There is nothing in the Constitution that says people have to pay attention to your free speech rights. Um, <laughs> you are free to speak about just about anything you want to, just about anywhere, but you are not free to make someone pay attention to you. So, um, anywhere else except Washington, protesters probably would get more attention paid for that. But once again, it happens in DC all of the time. There's always somebody protesting something. Um, so we don't get, we, we make a choice not to report about everything. Uh, this, not, not that this has anything to do with free speech rights, but it's the same reason why we don't, protest, we don't write about uh, bomb threats anymore. We don't write about, because the more you write about them, the, our, thinking, our thinking is the more you write about them, the more people will do it to get attention. So if we stop writing about them, maybe the number of people who call in bomb threats will decrease. And even if it doesn't, nobody will ever know because we don't write about them anymore. So, it's, it's along the same, once again, not, not comparing the one to the other, but sometimes we have to make choices about what we can and what we cannot write about, and that's one of the things that we, bomb is one of the things that we choose not to write about for a reason. Protests, we don't write about as much because they happen so often. If we, and being in the media, you're in the public eye, if you write about one protest and don't write about the next one, whoever puts on the second protest will say, hey, you're biased against us because they had 20 people, we had 25. So if you wrote about 20 people protesting, why didn't you write about our 25 people? Or maybe our 30 people, or maybe our 10 people. So the decision pretty much has been made that we won't write about any of them, unless something unusual happens. We're always on the lookout for things that will make people watch, read, and listen. Because by the way, I, I usually say this in different contexts, but I'll just say this here and now. The media is not a public service. The media is a business. We exist to make money. How do we make money? We make money by making you, the American consumer, watch, read, and listen. How do we make you watch, read, and listen? We attempt to figure out what you, as an American consumer, want to watch, read, and listen, and we provide it to you, bringing us all the way back around to, if it bleeds, it leads. Because we have found out that what people want to read, watch, and listen is sex, Death, controversy. That's what we give you, because we want you to read us and not the Wall Street Journal. Us and not the New York Times. Us and not the, uh, not the Washington Post. So, and we all compete to see who can get the most controversy, who can get the most, the most sex, who can get the most uh, death on our front pages. This is why more people know who Miley Cyrus is than they do Susan Collins. Susan Collins is the senator from Maine who almost got the government reopened by herself. No one knows who she is though. But we all know Miley, Miley Cyrus and the VMAs, what she did in the VMAs. 
I will admit, I didn't know who Miley Cyrus was. I had no idea who Robin Thicke was. I thought Robin Thicke was, I thought Robin Thicke was the guy from the Family Matters show. But yes, I see a question back in the back. Just speak up for me. Which by, guiding, by guiding individuals towards sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you're keeping them away from making an informed decision when they go out to the voting box. Isn't that irresponsible on your part? Uh, no. <laughs> Frankly, the reason why I say this is because there are stations that provide you exactly what you're talking about. They're called C-SPAN and PBX. How many people in here regularly watch C-SPAN and PBX? That's about 12 more than the hands I normally get. <laughs> the American public does not want what you just described. <laughs> That's yeah, true, true. Sure. I love rebuttals. Isn't it your job to steer them towards that? Because the <laughs> core principle of this, of this country is an act of voter base. Correct. Correct. I can say that you're directly contributing to the downfall of that through playing to the, the wants and needs of the American ego. We don't want to hear what's, what we don't want to hear. Right. It's your responsibility as a journalist to make us hear that, to shift the focus away from the stuff that doesn't influence public policy, like my desire is doing the right thing. I'm not thinking about that. I want to know what the government's doing to reopen. I'm a veteran. I'm I want to know what's going on. And if you're directly contributing to consumerism, to the mm -hmm. egos of, of people who don't care about that, I would say on a moral and ethical ground, you're wrong. Okay. I will accept that as your opinion. <laughs> However, I will also tell you that back in the early 90s, there was a news organization called the Good News Journal. What did the Good News Journal do? The Good News Journal decided that it would not write stories about sex, death, and controversy. It would provide the American public only news that the American public needed to know. It would provide the American public information about its government. It would provide the American public stories about Americans doing things that Americans should do, helping others, improving education. How long did the Good News Journal last? one week before they went out of business. Unfortunately, the American society is based on capitalism. To provide the American public things that we need the American people, let me rephrase it, to provide the American public with things we think the American public should know about, like, for example, the Supreme Court, we also have to provide the American public entertainment news, sports news. Just for example, here's a good example. At the VMA, we had five reporters covering the VMAs. We will have seven reporters covering the Oscars. We will, we're sending a team of, I believe, 25 reporters to Russia to cover the Olympics. We have two people covering the Supreme Court full time. We have five people covering the, the United States Congress. We have three people covering the White House. And the reason why this is, is because the Associated Press does not make money off these government coverage. Government coverage is what we do because we think we need to. What sells papers is sports and entertainment. So our first and foremost goal is to stay in business. Nothing else matters if we go out of business. So we provide the American public what we think the American public needs to know, in addition to what the American public wants to read. It's, it's a, I, I see, I'm coming back. It's, it's, a, it's a total shame. But the truth of the matter is, the highest rated news show on television right now is TMZ. The highest selling periodical publication.
publication in the United States right now, people walk and choose to pick it up is the National Enquirer. So, by their buying power, by their watching power, the American public has told us what they want. We still think that there are things you need to know, which is why I don't cover sports and, 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 and entertainment. I cover things that I think that the American public need to know about. But I also have to bow to the reality that is capitalism. If we only wrote about what we think the American public needs to know about, we would be out of business and we would be providing nothing. It is a compromise that all journalists have to make. It's the, um, the first compromise we have to make, we have to make is to advertise. I really wish that we didn't have to sell ads. But the reality of it is, and I had to learn this in college when I was running a college newspaper, the reality of it was, if you don't have ads on those pages, the publisher doesn't give you pages. So if you can't sell the, the product, you don't have a product to sell. So while as the editor of the paper, I thought I was the most important person on the paper, I quickly found out the ad manager was the most important person on the paper. Because if they didn't sell ads, we didn't get our salaries, we didn't have paid. It is one of the compromises that capitalism requires of journalists. And unfortunately, we have to, it's one of, one, of, one of the deals we have to make. See, I haven't got to see one right here, yes. Well, on the, on the newscast. Yes. Hitler had something similar to Joseph Cole. And and sure problem again. Yeah, our newscasts are like that because they put such a sl slighted view on, on their own opinion on, on the news. It's general. Amazingly enough, well, let me, since we're recording, I won't say that. <laughs> let me put it this way. American journalism used to be completely unique in the world in that American journalism attempted, attempted to be content neutral. For the longest time, the American journalism industry, I, I, let, let, let me back that up too, it wasn't the longest time. In, in the, war of 18, the War of 1812 was caused by a newspaper publisher because he wanted to sell paper. The sinking of the main. Main, right? 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 Spanish American War, caused by a newspaper publisher because he wanted to sell newspapers. He revved America up until they attacked another country because of newspaper business. After that, the American public, the American journalism industry moved toward content neutral, while the rest of the world continued to where they had most countries now have a liberal, most countries outside of the United States have a liberal and a conservative medium. For the longest time, America did not. Now, journalism companies have discovered that it is, that people are more likely to continue to watch, not just watch, but continue to watch stations that reflect their political views. This is why Fox and MSNBC do so well on television. And I guess I should say this. I'm a print journalist. I don't have any inside knowledge about how and why television journalists do what they do. I'm saying all of this as my own personal opinion, having watched these channels. The reason why a lot of these channels do what they do is because they have discovered that people will watch things they agree with. And a lot of times, what you're not watching, what you're watching is not news, it's commentary. Especially when it comes to cable show. You're not watching newspaper reporters. You're not watching television reporters. John Stewart is not a journalist. Rush Limbaugh is not a journalist. 
Uh, Sean Hannity is not a journalist. Bill O'Reilly is not a journalist. Rachel Maddow is not a journalist. They're not journalists. They're commentators. And in fact, if you ask them, they, they'll tell you they're entertainers. Their job is to get you to watch their show. So they will say what it takes to get you to watch their shows. My job as a journalist is not to get you to read, not to say anything to get you to read. My job is to take what I see and to translate it into a story that, if I'm lucky, will piss everybody off. Not just one side or the other. I've, I've had a good day when both the both sides of the both lawyers arguing on both sides call me and say, I hate your story. It was correct, but I did. That's when you know you wrote a good story, but everybody's mad. So somewhere, I guess somewhere in there was probably an answer to your question, right? It, it, it might show a lack of integrity, but it shows a great business sense. In the end, journalism is not a public, there's almost, I'll say it again, there's only two organizations that are not business oriented. That is PBS and C-SPAN, because they don't have to be. They're publicly funded. All the rest of us, even though the Associated Press is a nonprofit, all the rest of us have to sell product. Now, what the Associated Press does, what we sell, we sell content neutral news, which is rare in our current journalistic environment. We sell news, we sell the news by saying that if you read us, you will not get any political opinion one way or the other. You'll get just the news. You might not like the news we give you, but that's what, that's what you'll get. That's our, <laughs> amazing enough, that's an area of the media that we have all to ourselves right now. Everyone else does one way or the other. Bloomberg does business news. Reuters, Thompson Reuters does business news. We do general, straight, content neutral news. I apparently not. I probably, oh, wow. Okay, let me check the time. All right. If you have any more questions, I'll hang around for a while. Thank you for your attention.